Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we duplicate your brain with weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, we go back to 2011 to hear transhuman performance artist Stellark. But first, here's news of talking ducks and third thumbs. Talking ducks. Carol Tenkate of the Institute of Biology Leiden of Leiden University and Peter Fulligar, retired from the CSIRO Division of Wildlife and Ecology, have shown that the Australian musk duck, Biziora lobata, can learn to imitate sounds it hears as a duckling. Previously, no water or landfowl were known to be able to learn vocalizations, only to make a limited range of sounds by instinct. Vocal learning occurs in humans as well as some dolphins, whales, elephants and bats. In birds, it's mainly known in parrots, hummingbirds and songbirds like the lyrebirds. Lyrebirds have been recorded imitating 20 different bird calls in the wild, along with construction noises, chainsaws cutting wood, buses stopping to let out passengers and a human baby crying. In the evolutionary tree, the duck branch split off early from other bird groups 90 million years ago, so this ability would have developed through independent evolution from the other birds with vocal learning. Musk ducks are native to Western and Southeast Australia. A heavy-bodied, short-winged, grey-coloured ducks, the male is three times bigger than the female. They have short legs but large feet and dive readily but rarely fly. Adult males have a large pendulous lobe hanging below the bill. Musk ducks have rarely been bred in captivity, mainly because it's difficult to manage the aggressive mature males that are prone to attacking other waterfowl and people. Carol Tenkate had heard stories about a duck that could say, You bloody fool! and imitate the sound of a slam door. He eventually tracked down recordings made by Peter Fulliger in 1987. The two of them spoke, and Peter Fulliger explained how Ripper, the talking duck, had been hand-reared and would have heard a human voice and a slamming door as a duckling. He also had a recording of a female-reared musk duck imitating Pacific black duck quacks. The imitations were made during the male's mate advertising display. There are also reports of hand-reared musk ducks imitating a snorting pony, the cough of a caretaker and a squeaking door. Ripper was a male musk duck captive reared at Tidbinbilla Nature Reserve, which is about 50 kilometres southwest of Canberra. Unfortunately, all documents from Tidbinbilla were lost in a wildfire that swept through the reserve in 2003. Ripper was raised from a fresh egg from East Gippsland, Victoria in September 1983 and was the only musk duck present at the time of his rearing. The egg was hatched under a foster bantam hen and Ripper was raised and fed by hand without the foster hen. As an adult, Ripper was moved to a small pen surrounded by dense shrubbery and concealed from public view. This structure was divided into two halves with connecting holes below water level big enough for a female musk duck but too small for Ripper to pass through. Two female musk ducks were obtained from Serendip Reserve, Victoria sometime before Ripper was recorded. And these two female ducks were almost certainly present next to the pen when the sound recording was made. At four years old, Ripper would come up onto the narrow bank on the inside of the fence and scramble along trying to attack
attack anyone on the outside of the fence. He made his calls repeatedly, then dashed about on the small patch of water within the pen, splashing water everywhere. The vocalisation is most likely an imitation of something he heard from his caretaker all the time. But it's not known at what age he was exposed to it. Here's the recording of Ripper. The researcher received notes about a male musk duck reared from an egg transferred to Pensthorpe in the UK. The male was a wonderful mimic when he was quite young. You could hear a lot of coughing and the snorting pony which lived next door to him. He even tried an unpronounceable hello to the gardener. Another note talked about a male musk duck raised at Slimbridge Wildfowl Trust in the UK, which was two years old when he was observed to produce an imitation of the cough of the birdkeeper and the squeak of a turnstile. Sadly, there aren't any recordings. The paper was written jointly and titled Vocal Imitations and Production Learning by Australian Musk Ducks, Biziura Lobata, and was published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B. An extra thumb? Most prosthetics are aimed at replacing missing limbs, but researchers from the University College London Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in the UK trained people to use an extra robotic thumb to see how their brains coped with an augmented body. People coped very well, reporting that it felt like a part of their body. Designer Danny Claude began developing the third thumb as part of an award-winning graduate project at the Royal College of Art, seeking to reframe the way we view prosthetics, from replacing a lost function to an extension of the human body. She was later invited to join Professor Tamar Macon's team of neuroscientists at the University of College London who were investigating how the brain can adapt to body augmentation. The third thumb is 3D printed, making it easy to customise and is worn on the side of the hand opposite your actual thumb, near the little finger. It's controlled by pressure sensors attached to the underside of both big toes. The two big toe sensors control different movements of the thumb by immediately responding to subtle changes of pressure from the wearer and wirelessly sending the commands to the third thumb. 20 able-bodied people in the study were trained to use the third thumb over five days, during which they were also encouraged to take the thumb home each day after training, to use it in daily life scenarios, for a total of two to six hours of wear time each day. As a control, another 10 able-bodied people wore a version of the thumb that couldn't move while completing the same training. In the study, people were trained to use the thumb focusing on tasks that helped increase the cooperation between their hand and the thumb, such as picking up multiple balls or wine glasses with one hand. They learned the basics of using the thumb very quickly, while the training enabled them to successfully improve their motor control, dexterity and hand-thumb coordination. People in the study were even able to use the thumb when distracted, building a wooden block tower while doing a maths problem, or while blindfolded. People found that they were able to do with one hand tasks that normally require two hands. For example, holding a cup of tea and stirring it with a spoon at the same time. Or dipping a wand into a bubble mixture and blowing bubbles while holding the bottle of bubble mixture in the same hand. Before and after the training, the researchers scanned the brains of people in the study using functional magnetic resonance imaging, while the participants were moving their fingers individually, but not wearing the thumb while in the scanner. The researchers found subtle but significant changes to how the hand had been augmented with the third thumb 
as opposed to the other hand, was represented in the brain's sensory motor cortex. In our brains, each finger is represented distinctly from the others. Among the study participants, the brain activity pattern corresponding to each individual finger became more similar, or less distinct. A week later, some of the participants were scanned again, and the changes in their brain's hand area had subsided, suggesting that changes might not be long-term, although more research is needed to confirm this. Professor Macon, lead author of the study, said evolution hasn't prepared us to use the extra body part, and we've found that to extend our abilities in new and unexpected ways, the brain will need to adapt the representation of the biological body. First author of the study, Paulina Kailiba, said body augmentation could one day be valuable to society in numerous ways, such as enabling a surgeon to get by without an assistant, or a factory worker to work more efficiently. This line of work could revolutionise the concept of prosthetics, and it could help someone who permanently or temporarily can only use one hand, to do everything with that hand. But to get there, we need to continue researching the complicated interdisciplinary questions of how these devices interact with our brains. The Plasticity Lab at the University College London Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience is concerned with the fact that over 50% of amputees don't use their prosthetics regularly, suggesting both that the prosthetics aren't designed well enough and that the training isn't sufficient. The Plasticity Lab explores whether brain resources uniquely developed for hand representation can become repurposed to support artificial limbs, and whether neural embodiment of prosthetic limbs can be improved. The paper was titled Robotic Hand Augmentation Drives Changes in Neural Body Representation and was published in the journal Science Robotics. This work strongly reminded me of the performance artist Stellark's work with extra limbs and senses. You're listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Science at diffusionradio.com. Brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. What would life be like if you added an extra prosthetic limb? Stellark is a performance artist at the University of Western Sydney and Brunel University in London. He's had a third hand, an extended arm, an extra ear, a prosthetic head, a six-legged robot body, and had his body remotely controlled over the internet. In 2011, Stellark spoke to me at the Singularity Summit Australia in the grounds of the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Well, most of these projects and performances explore alternate anatomical architectures. Uh, What's it like to perform with a, a third hand, an extended arm, walk with a six legged a robot, have an extra ear on your arm. (laughs) And you've actually done and built all these things. Well, certainly these performances enable the artist to directly experience the mechanism and in experiencing it, thereby being able to meaningfully articulate about uh, that experience. And we're here at the Singularity Summit. (laughs) And a lot of people would think a lot of what you're doing, I mean, you're modifying yourself. You're going through very new experiences. You had an extra arm, an extra ear, all sorts of things. What does the Singularity mean to you? Well, I think it should be a highly contestable idea. (laughs) I don't think anything happens through sheer necessity. Being sort of human... Uh, contingency is always going to play a part as well as course catastrophes and other unexpected uh, future events or or developments in technology so the singularity is an interesting concept the idea of increasing 
acceleration and speed and power and precision of our technologies leading to a point perhaps of, of, a, of a super intelligence or, or robot systems that might re even replace human bodies. But I think it's going to be a situation of, of unexpected outcomes. I mean, for example, the increasing miniaturization of technology might mean, as one contestable future, that all technology uh, will be invisible because it'll be inside us. <laughs> so we may not change at all in appearance, but the micro robots, the nano sensors will be inhabiting the inside of the human body. And can you explain for the listeners about your ear, your extra ear? Well, at the moment, there's a, a relief of an ear on my uh, left arm. This has uh, been surgically constructed and cell grown. So through a process of stretching the skin and then inserting a, a porous material called MedPore, this encourages cell growth into the scaffold construct. After six months, you have tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. So at present time, the ear is fused to my arm and uh, it has its own blood supply. We still have to lift the helix to create an ear flap. We have to grow a soft ear lobe using my adult stem cells. But when the 3D ear is, is completed, then we'll reinsert a small microphone into the ear connected to a wireless transmitter. So in any Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, the ear becomes internet enabled. <laughs> so if you're here in Melbourne and I'm in London, you'll be able to listen in to what my ear is hearing there. That's amazing. <laughs> and could you give us a, a short description of the project where people remotely controlled your body over the internet? Well, in fact, that was that project begins in 1996 at a, uh, an event called Telepolis. It was titled Fractal Flesh. And I was in Luxembourg, people in the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, the Doors of Perception Conference in Amsterdam, for example, were able, through a touchscreen interface, they were able to remotely access and remotely activate my body elsewhere. I had a head-up display, I could see the face of the person moving me, mm -hmm. so there was a kind of an intimacy without proximity, an intimacy without skin contact. And this was a performance that went over two days to allow for, you know, the overlapping sort of locations and, and, and events that were occurring that were connected to this performance. It was very strange to watch more than half of your body move involuntarily. You had not desired to move in that way, nor had you yourself contracted your muscles to do so. This was done by people in other places and it was done uh, via a, a touchscreen muscle stimulation system computer programmed. And there was another performance called Ping Body where instead of people in other places remotely activating the body it was using the ping protocol pinging 40 global locations and the re reverberating ping signals were mapped to the body's muscles and so the body became a kind of barometer of internet activity. My body was more actively moving. It indicated simply that there was more activity occurring in that particular global location. And then the parasite performance was where we engineered a, a customized search engine that scans the, the net for the duration of the performance. It finds images of the body or arms or legs or, or and those images then are analyzed and it's the image analysis that results in the involuntary movements of the body or in other words the image that I was seeing through this internet search is the image that's moving me so we we've gone from the face of the person moving me to uh, an image harvested on the net that moves the body in some way. That's extraordinary. You built an extra arm? Oh, well, it's uh, an extended arm. Well, there, there were two projects. Uh, the third hand, which is third in fact hand. completed in 1980. That was the first sort of major project I guess I was involved in, but it was state of the art at the time. 
and I was invited by the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and the Johnson Space Center in Houston to demonstrate this mechanical hand to the extravehicular activity group. There was a, another project called the Extended Arm, which in fact extends my human arm to primate proportions. Uh, that was an 11 degree of freedom manipulator and I could actuate that producing a sort of a, a choreography of finger and wrist rotation movements. So the sensors on my left arm which was involuntarily moving generating the different sounds in that acoustical landscape augmented by the sounds of the compressed air and the clicking sounds of the fingers from the 11 degree of freedom extended arm. <laughs> so it was kind of a split physiology. On the left side, voltage in to actuate my, my left arm, voltage out to control a mechanism. Amazing. Stella, <laughs> thank you very much. That was the amazing Stella with his infectious and unique laugh. Since 2011, Stella has performed several projects. Here are the descriptions from his website, with the sounds from his audiograms. In 2016, the rewired, remixed, event for dismembered body radical ecologies was performed in Perth. For five days, six hours continuously every day, the body could only see with the eyes of someone in London, it could only hear with the ears of someone in New York, whilst anyone, anywhere, could access the artist's right arm via the online interface to the exoskeleton and remotely animate it. The body was in three places at once, virtually and visually in London, virtually and acoustically in New York, but physically grounded in Perth. Its presence was marked by a double absence. It becomes an extended operational system of remote bodies, streaming data, head-up display, an exoskeleton with the artist's awareness constantly shifting from the virtual to the physical. Visitors to the gallery could interact with the exoskeleton arm via a touch screen, while people online could also insert their choreography. Performing with a posture of indifference, performing with no expectations. Allowing events to unfold in their own time and with their own rhythm. In 2017, Stickman was performed in Perth, a simultaneously possessed and performing body that is algorithmically actuated with a six degree of freedom exoskeleton for a five hour continuous performance. An exoskeleton as a wearable robot. 64 possible combination of limb motions are generated by its computational system, but the body had one leg to stand on, making it possible to turn on its axis retaining its balance, manipulating its shadow and modulating the projected video feedback. Sensors on the exoskeleton generate the acoustical landscape, both registering the limb movements and augmenting the pneumatic sounds and mechanical sounds. A multi-channel speaker system circulates the sound around the space. With latter iterations, a six degree of freedom mini stick man was engineered. By bending the limbs of the mini stick man, the audience was able to insert their own choreography into the performance, a kind of virtual voodoo. In 2020, at the Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art, Stella performed Reclining Stick Man, a 9 metre long, 4 metre high, 9 degree of freedom reclining stick robot was engineered animated by antagonistically bundled pneumatic rubber muscles. If no one intervenes, a background algorithm intimately actuates the robot. The robot is continuously rotating on its axis, its changing shadow projected onto three walls. The pneumatic rubber muscles contract and extend, generating a sense of anthropomorphic aliveness. Visitors to the gallery space can send commands to the robot via a panel of switches, whilst people in other places can move the robot remotely online. In a five hour performance attached to the torso of the robot, the artist can insert his own movements using pneumatic joysticks. 
counterpointing, synchronising and improvising to local and remote actuations of the robot. The droning of the motor sounds, the solenoid clicking sounds and the compressed air not only register the movements of the robot, but also amplify its physical presence. Stellark's website is stellark.org. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please subscribe to the Diffusion Science Radio channel on youtube.com slash c slash diffusion radio and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod or Mincompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in North East Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.